नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय We find in the words of Sri Narada Muni how powerful and effective the preaching of Hiranyakashipu was to dispel the darkness of ignorance from his mother, sister-in-law, and other relatives. He knew the philosophy. He presented it effectively. For the purpose of relieving the grief, especially of her mother, his mother, and he did so. Narada Muni tells, that she thus engaged her mind and attention in understanding the real philosophy of life. That we are not products of material energy. That we are eternal souls. In those days, even the demons understood this. Even the demons understood that there was a Supreme God. They understood that they were spiritual by nature, separate from this physical temporary body, and that they were eternal, full of knowledge full of bliss. The demons knew this. The difference between the demons and the devotees is despite knowing this, still, they wanted to, under, un, they wanted to be controllers, enjoyers, and proprietors in competition with the Supreme God. And because Krishna is the source of remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness, and Krishna reciprocates with everyone by facilitating a particular type of consciousness to fulfill their desires, Krishna gives the demons the conviction that they could kill the Supreme God, that they could compete with him and defeat him. Does that sound contradictory? They know he's the Lord of everything, the source of all that exists. And they know philosophy so well. They know Vedas better than anybody could know Vedas today as far as memorization and the power to speak. And they could perform such tremendous tapasya and gain great, great mystical powers that nobody could even dream of in today's world. Not ordinary beings these demons were talking about. And they know where all that power is coming from. They know it's coming from God. But now that they have it, they want to compete with God. Now any five-year-old boy like Prahlad understands that it doesn't make sense. Hiranyakashipu asked Prahlad, where do you get your power from? Prahlad said, from the same place you get your power from 
from the same place everyone gets their power from, from the all-powerful, the source of everything, from Vishnu, the Lord. Now, was he telling here Anyakashipu something he didn't know? He already knew that. <laughs> but he didn't want to hear it. He was in very serious denial. Why? Because of his motivations. So how we can be covered over by our motivations? And the Lord, who is the Paramatma, the Super Soul within the heart, He's facilitating a particular type of consciousness, remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness according to our motivations. If anyone desires to be the supreme, even to the point of fighting Vishnu, who's the cause of all causes, the source of everything, the absolute truth, that same Vishnu who's within your heart will pervert your intelligence to actually think you can do it. Yes, Vishnu's God, but if I kill him, then I become God. Yes? Some kind of really perverted politics. So if I, if I, if I assassinate the prime minister, then I will become the prime minister. Yes? If I overthrow the government, these coups, they overthrow the government, it happens all the time in Africa, it's happened so many places in the world. In fact, India did it. <laughs> we want to overthrow the government and take the post. And usually the prime people who are organizing the overthrowing of government, their ambition is to be in control. And historically, oftentimes, it happens. You overthrow the government, the general who takes it, he becomes the president, or the king, Hare Krishna. So the same mentality, these demons, like Hiranyakashipu, are thinking toward God. Yes, God's the source of everything, but if I kill him, I become God. Hare Krishna. Makes no sense. But common sense is not very common. <laughs> it never was, and it probably never will be. Common sense is the most uncommon thing. And why is that? Because of our desires. When we have perverted desires, then the Lord, in order to facilitate our trying to fulfill those desires, He has to pervert our intelligence. He has to pervert our whole perspective of reality. Otherwise, there's no hope that our perverted desires could ever be fulfilled. So what Hiranyakashipu doesn't understand is he's just a puppet. He has a desire. But the Lord in his heart is facilitating, and the modes of material nature are empowering him by the Lord's will. Or let us say by the Lord's arrangement. The Lord does not will that anyone becomes cruel and demoniac. But the Lord wills that the living entity has such freedom and that material nature will facilitate. That is his arrangement. So Hiranyakashipu, he's asking Prahlad, where do you get your power from? He already knew. But he was covered over. And when Prahlad Maharaj told him, from the same place you do, from the Lord, from Vishnu, he was outraged. That was, that was the most intolerable thing that could possibly be said to him. So 
to let me see your Lord save you now, I will kill you. Hare Krishna smashed his fist against a pillar in great anger, charged at Prahlad to sever his head. The pillar was shaking. The whole palace started shaking. The screaming sound that nobody ever heard before echoed in all directions. Hiranyakashipu was bewildered. He was looking around. Where is that noise coming from? What's happening? Who is it? And out from the pillar, Sri Narasinghate, the supreme absolute truth. And even he's having darshan with this most ferocious, opulent, powerful form of the Lord in his most angry mood. Hmm? Now Krishna is all beautiful, but he's supreme in everything he does. When the Lord is angry, he is supremely angry. <laughs> Whatever anger even the greatest demons have is only infinitesimal part and parcel of the anger that Vishnu could have. Can you imagine standing before the Lord revealing his supreme anger? And all his anger is directed toward you. <laughs> that was the darshan Hiranyakashipu had. Now, for most of us, we would definitely bow our heads down and say, please be merciful to me and forgive me, my Lord. But Hiranyakashipu, because of his desire and because of his false, false pride, he was so blinded, he was convinced in his heart that he would kill Narasimha Dev. And he attacked him with a sword. Like a, like a moth flying into a blazing fire. And he really was convinced he could win. Where did that conviction come from? Now all of us, we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, we, we're hearing about what this amazing form of the Lord. And everyone knows he's going to lose. Except him. Naham prakasha saravasya yoga maya samavrata mudo yam nabi janati. Bhagavad Gita explains how this, how this potency of maya just completely covers our intelligence. Maya means that which is not. And so many levels and degrees by which we come under this deluding potency. But scientists today, they don't have even a fraction of the intelligence or common sense that the demons of yesterday did. They don't believe there is a God. Hiranyakashipu did. They don't believe there is a soul. Hiranyakashipu did. And they are the greatest educators in the college and universities, writing textbooks, giving lectures, influencing society. And Prabhupada quotes that one very famous atheist who is making so many followers. And part of his preaching was he would stand in a public place and get hundreds of people to gather around him. And he would say, God, if you really exist, 
then strike me dead now. I challenge you. I dare you. If you're all powerful, strike me dead, you rascal. Come on, come on, fight, let's go. Strike me dead. Nothing happens. He'd say, I see, there is no God. If he would have God, he would have done it. He, he, if he's God, he heard me. Why didn't he do anything? He's a coward. God can't be a coward, so there is no God. People, oh, that makes sense. Very good, very good. Prabhupada quoted the communists. They would create by their own political manipulation poverty so people didn't have food. And then they would come, so much exploitation, they would create a poverty so that people didn't have food. Government has that power. And then they would tell people, oh, you believe in God? Well, pray to God to give you some bread. So they pray. And no bread was there. And they'd say, pray to us. Give me bread. So they're hungry. What are they going to do? They say, please, Mr. Communist, <laughs> give me bread. And right then they would just ring a bell and a truck would come and distribute so much bread. Say, so, what is this God? Worship us. We are your authority. And people believed them. It was very practical philosophy. But we find in all of their scriptures that the great demons who were really, really powerful, they knew it. They knew the soul, they knew God, they knew everything. The only problem is their desire. And it's so amazing how the Lord covers you over according to your desire. <coughs> Duryodhana, he knew that Krishna is God. And Krishna is coming to plead with him. Give five villages to the Pandavas. And he say, no, I will not. He knows he's God. Duryodhana, actually, when he saw that Krishna wasn't cooperating, he ordered his soldiers to arrest Krishna and put him in jail. <laughs> and when this is, and right in front of Duryodhana, Soldiers attacked him, and Krishna manifested his Virat Rupa, a universal form, which is brighter than thousands of suns with arms and legs and heads and every unbelievable. So the soldiers ran back. Duryodhana was just in great reverence. But still, even after seeing the universal form, he wouldn't listen to Krishna. Krishna's telling him, you're going to be destroyed if you don't be fair with the Pandavas. He still wouldn't do it. He went in the battlefield to fight against the Pandavas when Krishna leading the forces on the chariot. And practically everyone on the Kuru armies knew that Krishna's God, to some extent or another. The 11th chapter, he showed the universal form. <laughs> common sense is very uncommon. Because of our ulterior motives. Essentially because of our insincerity. If there was one thing Srila Prabhupada emphasized more than anything, it was that we should be sincere. Take this Krishna consciousness very seriously. Because if Krishna sees that we are sincere, Krishna gives us clear intelligence. 
we can understand things very simply. If we're insincere, the simplest things are so complicated and unapproachable. If we're sincere, the most complicated things are very simple. There's Katanjana Smrite Yasmin. In Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said, for one who <coughs> takes shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sincerely, <coughs> even the most difficult things become very simple to understand and to execute. But for one who does not take shelter of the Lord, even the simplest things become inconceivable and impossible. Isn't that true? <laughs> the logic that you're not the body but you're the soul is so easy to understand. Why people cannot understand it? And even if they do understand it theoretically, why they don't really believe it? These are two things we were discussing a little yesterday. There's understanding and there's believing. You can understand something intellectually, but to actually have faith in it takes the grace of God. Faith does not come simply by our intellectualization. You can write many books. <laughs> I remember when I was giving lectures in colleges in America in the 1980s, early part of that decade. <laughs> and we went to one college on the border of Ohio and Kentucky and West Virginia, Huntington University. And we, we were going to different professors presenting that we can give lectures in your classes. We would go to the, the, to the press professors of sociology, history, religion, philosophy, so many things like that. And every professor was really interested but they said, you have to get the permission of the chairman of the religious department. Without, if you get his permission, we'll be happy to have you. But the, but the <coughs> policy of the college is no one who speaks about any type of spirituality or religion can speak without the authorization of the chairman of the religion department. And they were, when they would spoke about him, they would practically offer their dandavats. <laughs> and they told us about him. He was such a scholar of Christianity. <laughs> Not only that, he was a preacher. He was an ordained minister. And he would give powerful academic lectures and inspirational lectures in all the churches and cathedrals. He would be invited to synagogues to give his lectures. So we approached him. And he denied us the right. He said, no, I will not allow you. And then he said, I don't believe that your God is God. So I can't let you mislead people. So we got in a whole philosophical debate for probably a couple hours whether Krishna could be God. Yes? And then he had to go somewhere. He said, come back tomorrow and we'll continue our debate. So we come back tomorrow, 
it was really strange. We go into his office. Do you know what a sun lamp is? It's a lamp that somehow makes you it's, get the color as if you're under the sun. Because <laughs> these American kinds of people are sometimes really white in color. And for them, beauty is to have dark complexion. <laughs> really. For Americans, white is ugly. You have to have a white... A, it's very beautiful to be tan. Like an Indian. In India, they feel if you're white, it's very beautiful. It's not nice to be dark. But in America, if you're dark, it's very beautiful. It's not nice to be white. Yes? So the sun lamp is, even in the winter, you can get nice suntan and get nice brownish complexion by laying under a sun lamp. So I went into his office, and he's laying naked on a big table. It wasn't a bed, it was just like a table. He was laying naked, with nothing on, no, not even Copens. <laughs> <laughs> under sun lamps. And he said, yes, let us continue our debate. <laughs> I told him, you know, <laughs> I told him there's too many distractions for me to do. <laughs> so, after you get your suntan, we'll debate. So he said, all right, all right. So for a couple days, we couldn't give any lectures. All we could do is debate with him. And finally, all of his arguments were quite defeated. And he said, he said to me, I want to confide in you. Something I've never told anyone in my whole life. He said, there is no God. I said, where did you read that, you know? <laughs> You're giving lectures in all these churches. You're writing books about God. And you don't believe there's God? He said, he said, I teach it, I lecture it, because it's my profession. Because it's my speciality. It's what made me famous. It's my occupation. But I can tell you honestly, I don't believe a word of it. And interesting enough, do you know what his name was? Professor Maybe. <laughs> so I said, don't you think that even maybe, your name is Maybe, maybe there's a God? He said, no, no. But then the amazing thing is, he's, is uh, he said, well, your God, whatever, it really doesn't matter, so you might as well give lectures. So he wrote a this, <laughs> sanctioning. So then we got to go in all the classes. So yes. It's not so difficult to understand things intellectually. But it takes the grace of God to really have faith. And that is why Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, Srila Prabhupada, they emphasize that faith comes by hearing and serving in the association of devotees people who have faith. 
Lord Nityananda, I will give you love of God through Harinam. The only price is your faith. Adoshadatata sadhu sangoda vajanakriya. The very basis, the beginning of our whole spiritual life is the foundation of faith. In the beginning, there's just a little bit of faith. Perhaps due to some agyata sukriti, perhaps due to some past life, there's some little faith. Faith in the, sub, in the sublime nature of God beyond this material world. And Krishna reciprocates with that faith from within the heart and directs us to the association of devotees where that faith could be nourished, cultivated, and ultimately it becomes bhava and prema through the process of devotional service. If you want a justification to enjoy this world, be the controller and the proprietor, according to the mode of nature and the intensity of your desire, this, the Paramatma, who is unlimited, could perform the most incredible miracles with your consciousness. These terrorists, they re... I, I would think that they really believe what they're saying. They really believe that if you kill these people, you will get the rewards in heaven. Innocent people, women, children, even people of your own religion, if they happen to be walking by, that doesn't matter. They believe that. God gives them that perversion intelligence. If you really want to get away with something, Paramat will give you the faith that you can get away with it. Even though it's absolutely crazy. Yes? People see how drugs destroy people's lives. Heroin. Cocaine. I was told it's becoming really fashionable here in Bombay. Cocaine. It's one of the most malicious, dangerous, horrible, life-ruining drugs ever. In the West, we have seen so many people, lives are absolutely destroyed because they're addicted they become addicted to this cocaine. You see it. You hear about it. Why would anyone want to do it? Feels good. Because the Paramatma just completely warps their intelligence. Take this heroin. Take this cocaine. You're going to suffer. You're going to become addicted. You're going to die. And you're thinking, no, not me. Maybe everybody else, but not me. And you do it. Absolutely no sense at all. The only way anyone could do those things after seeing and hearing what's going on is the Paramatma has to completely cover your intelligence. And why does he cover your intelligence? Because that's what you want. Otherwise you can't enjoy it. So, Hiranyakashipu, how much he was covered over? Duryodhana, how he was covered over? Seeing the universal form, seeing Lord Narasimha Dev, and still thinking, I will win. Hare Krishna. So, Hiranyakashipu was theoretically speaking very nice philosophy. And Srila Prabhupada in purport is describing how 
his audience was very receptive because they were miserable. One of the greatest distresses is when your loved ones die. Now, Hiranyaksha, probably no one in this room feels any sympathy toward him. But everything is relative. To his wife and his mother, he was the greatest person on earth. He was simply wonderful. That's the Paramatma <laughs> doing, doing his work, giving people a particular intelligence, a particular knowledge according to their particular motivations. <coughs> and Prabhupada describes the one is very much interested in philosophy at a funeral. When one is sobbing and weeping. Because death is so final, there's just nothing you could do about it. Other types of distress, you can always have the hope that I could fix it and make it better. Yes? You lose money, we'll try again, we'll make it back. You lose your health, well, I'll go to this clinic and I'll do this diet and I'll somehow or other try to get it back. Practically anything in this world you lose, you can get it back. There's hope. But when someone that you love is dead, there is no hope. It's finished. You can never get them back. It's final. So it's really deep pain for one who has attachment. And this final thing called death is such a mystery. People naturally are inclined toward philosophically understanding what is it and why and who am I? At that point when you're seeing the same body looking the same way as it did when it was asleep but the person's gone. It's so obvious that he never was his body. What is this thing called death? Why are we destroying the body? Somewhere deep down inside, everyone has to think like this, consciously or unconsciously. But unfortunately, after the intensity of the experience, we go back to our materialistic way of life. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada is citing Queen Kunti. Better to stay in distress. <laughs> because when you're in distress, you turn to God if you have some piety. And even these impious people were turning to, turning to philosophy. But when happiness again comes, when the distress is relieved, the tendency is again just to go back into the, your normal routine of materialistic ways. So Queen Kunti Prabhupada quotes, she's saying that I prefer distress over happiness. How many of you could honestly say that? <coughs> you all know what distress is about. We're not talking about, you know, getting, um, you know, a fly landing in your head <laughs> and bothering you a little. We're talking distress. Queen Kunti was talking about real distress, a mother's love. Her husband, her, own, her husband 
is cursed. That's pretty distressful, isn't it? Her husband is cursed. He's supposed to be the king, but because of this curse, he gives up his right to the kingdom and goes to the forest. That's distress. And then he makes a mistake. And just one mistake. It wasn't like he was planning the mistake. It wasn't like he was, you know, writing out a whole strategic plan of how to do this thing. He was just weak for a moment. And in that weakness of the moment, he just made a mistake that he didn't even really want to do. And because of that, well, before that, he was, yeah, he was cursed. Then he dies. And she's got these five children, three of her own and two. And in those days, the death of a husband was serious distress. Most women, they would rather burn in the funeral pyre with their husband than live. It was too painful to live without him. And that's the way she was. She wanted to do that. Madri did it. But all the sages and rishis said, no, no, you have to stay to take care of these children. So she stayed. She's a widow. Then she goes back to Hastinapur, and then she sees this whole conflict with Duryodhana, Dushasana, Dhritarashtra, and they're spreading all horrible things against her children. It was really serious political atmosphere. Now, you know how complicated and frustrating politics could be. Yes, even if there's just a little politics in the brahmacharya ashram, it causes havoc. Well, there's politics at home causes so much distress, especially to the parents when there's politics between the children. And what is politics? It usually means they're competing over who gets proprietorship or control over something. That's what politics is about. Competition over control and power and ownership.